Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, welcome back to another episode of Books and Budge, where we discuss two of the greatest things on planet Earth, books and buds. That's right. So today, as you can see, I brought a special guest. This is my dear friend and business partner, co-owner of Burning Bush. And I brought him on because he's the one that turned me on to the book we'll be discussing today, Deception Point by Dan Brown. He really um, is, is just the biggest fan of this guy, and I'm thrilled that he introduced me to him, and now I've read just about all of his books. But the reason we're going to be discussing Deception Point today is because it is one of his lesser-known novels, and I just can't figure out for the life of me why. Now, most of his Robert Langdon books you'd probably say are religious-based. Uh, religious conspiracies, yes. So he's known as a conspiracy writer. But I believe that's why that's such a popular series because it's uh, it's Dan it's uh, Robert Langdon and it's just a continual story of Robert Langdon and so I think it's it's that's become popular because there's multiple books that you can you can follow in the series. I think well it also helps that his first one that got a lot of attention was uh, Angels and Demons and then after Deception Point the name Robert Langdon just became household name. But still, I mean, this one needs to be discussed. Now, this was a political conspiracy thriller. I think it involved NASCAR? NASA. NASA. <laughs> it's been a long time since I read this book, so that's another reason I got my buddy in here today. He just read it again recently. Yeah, basically you have um, the President of the United States is in a tough bind where he's, uh, he's basically, he likes to fund, he's, he's a NASA um, enthusiast. Yeah. And uh, his political opponent, Senator Sex, uh, Sedgwick Sexton, is uh, he wants to defund NASA, and that's basically the primary focus of his uh, campaign, yeah. is the, uh, the NASA waste. And so basically what happens in this book is there's a, a discovery of the Milan ice shelf in the Arctic that can change everything. Mm. And, um, and so that's basically um, the basis of the book is this massive NASA discovery it's just uh, it's it's an incredibly fast-paced novel that just uh, I, I, it's it's an incredible book. It's Dan Brown. If anyone here is familiar with Dan Brown's work, I mean, he's probably with James Patterson and maybe Dean Koontz, one of the fastest-paced writers around. That's another reason we love him so much. You just every chapter has a cliffhanger, and you can't help it. It's like uh, late at night, you got to go to bed. You can't. It starts off within the first two pages. I mean, it's incredible. First two pages, this this, this um, scientist on the ice shelf gets picked up by uh, 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 this plane comes down on skis and tells this scientist to get right in the plane. And as they go up and they fly off, and this is within the first couple pages, they open the, the cargo door and drop the guy right out of the, the aircraft, and, and you're just left going, "What the hell?" And then it just right. and then it goes to Washington, and you don't find out why this happens until near the end of the book. Yeah, and but right off it hooks you like what 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 the hell just happened? You you I mean, this this important individual who you think is going to be a main character in the book is killed off within the first two pages, I believe. He's incredible like that. So this book uh, instead of Robert Langdon, our hero is a woman a woman named Rachel Sexton. She's the uh, she's the senator's daughter. Now he the senator Cedric Sexton, like Chris said, was the one that's trying to take over the White House. He's trying to defeat the current president. So she's our main character. She's actually working against her father, but she gets involved because it, this discovery in the Arctic shelf is uh, a meteor that apparently landed 300 years ago. We don't want to give you too much detail how the meteor got there or why it's there, but it's wildly important to this, this novel. So it's very fast-paced because just like his Robert Langdon novels, her and her buddy, Mike, Michael Tollin. Michael Tollin. He was the sidekick in this one, so it's a role reversal between Robert, Robert Langdon and, a, and another female, whereas this is uh, Rachel's the main character. She's the hero, and Tollin is basically her mm. sidekick. I would honestly love it if he used Rachel as a main character in many more books because he can probably do a lot of conspiracy thrillers with her. She's just an amazing character. I'd like to see him do more with her. But, you know, that's up to Dan Brown and. So we don't want to give away too much of the book, but I, just let me tell you, this thing is fantastic. If you're into Dan Brown at all, read this book. It was awesome. But with that said, um, there is a lot of critics. What we do, we'd like to review a lot of other people that review books. And one of the biggest names, unfortunately, that comes up with criticism with Dan Brown is Stephen King. He was quoted as saying that Dan Brown is the culinary equivalent to macaroni and cheese. And 
We just completely disagree with that. Well, first off, I love macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and secondly, I, I'm a foodie and I like going out to eat in nice restaurants. And almost every nice restaurant nowadays has some sort of fancy macaroni and cheese, whether it be chili mac, buffalo mac, or lobster. And uh, so uh, let's just say macaroni and cheese kicks ass. And uh, secondly, I'd, uh, I'd kind of like to say that if Dan Brown is the culinary um, equivalent of macaroni and cheese, and that's meant to be an insult, I have to say, sorry, Stephen King, no disrespect, but you are the horse-drawn equivalent, uh, horse-drawn carriage equivalent of a race car, whereas Dan Brown is a top-fuel dragster. His uh, books are breakneck pace. Mm -hmm. um, I, they are just page-turners. There is no point where you can actually just set the book down where you think there's a lull. It's just maximum speed the whole way. It's, it's, it, every one of his books is, is so fast-paced. They're just page-turners. I love reading Dan Brown. Yeah, absolutely right. I agree 100%. I agree 100%, but like you said, there's no disrespect to Stephen King because oh, I read him for different reasons. I love Stephen King, absolutely. Yeah, it's, I read him when I want something slow and drawn out, and I read someone like, like Dan Brown or James Patterson or Dean Koontz when I want something a little faster paced. So. I mean, it's an adrenaline rush. Dan Brown is always an adrenaline rush, where Stephen yeah. King is a master storyteller that weaves uh, incredible landscapes and stories, but they're just... Um, but uh, to, to say that Dan Brown is macaroni and cheese, I mean, it's it's just it just doesn't. Again, unless he was doing right. it as a compliment because he himself loves macaroni and cheese as much as I do. Yeah, I mean, as a as a writer myself, I can understand where Stephen King's coming from because he he calls it lazy writing when you use things like uh, crutch words and stuff like that. So I did see a little bit what he was talking about in um, his book, The Lost Symbol. I saw the word felt five times in a matter of three paragraphs. But that's just what he does. He uses these crutch words to just pick up the pace a little bit, and as uh, someone who also likes to read a lot, I appreciate that, because this is meant to be a fast-paced book. It's a conspiracy thriller. Stephen King doesn't really write conspiracy thrillers. He likes to draw out things almost like a literary literary fiction book, so awesome. Uh, just You guys read it. Make a decision for yourself. Well, I'd also say, the last thing I'd like to say about Dan Brown is I'm, I'm one of those people that uh, I can ruin a movie watching with him. I'm, watching it with you because I I can attest to that I literally go that that could never happen and and and, and how is this going on when why did they do it like that and and I, I really analyze things in a way that my brain just goes yeah it just doesn't work whereas Dan Brown it's one of those things it's every time I get into this yeah you're you're, you're kind of losing me here that doesn't make sense and within a couple pages he just describes and spins it in a way where you're like oh I didn't see that coming and wow that makes sense now even though it's far-fetched and fictional he, he weaves it in such a way where I can actually get into it and believe it and I don't I don't feel like I'm reading a complete you know, like crock of crap it's 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 it's, it's, it, it's very immersing and, and I can really get into his novels because he he does um, describe all all these things that makes you go yeah I don't know if that works and then all of a sudden he just he fixes it all puts it all together in a way that it just it works and and though I know all of his works are, are pure fiction um, the the research that he does for his novels and the way he puts the information together, you feel like you're reading something that really happened. Um, you yeah. can, I can really get into it. Whereas like Marvel and, and, and some of these uh, things that are popular nowadays, they're just so far-fetched and fantastical. They're fun to get into, but they're, they're hard to believe that it could really happen. Whereas these stories, you get to the end and you're like, it, 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 they actually almost make you feel uncomfortable on your, 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 I mean, for instance, all the, um, the Robert Langdon stories, the, uh, controversy that it's caused with religious people they're just all up in arms and it's like well it's a fiction story and he writes it so well that people are like no 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 and they they, they gotta they gotta sit there and, and, and well throw he, off their hands he does do a lot of cool things where he brings attention to religion i mean i mean i remember when i read the da vinci code i had to look up the book that he used as a reference it was called uh, uh holy holy blood holy grail or oh, something yes. like that so I, I ended up going through it and found out that a lot of the things were true but that's that's good to prompt you to look into the history of these religions so you're not walking through life ignorant to, the, to your beliefs. Um, and, and Chris is right. He does do a lot of that stuff where it, you almost feel like you're being entertained, but you're also being educated at the same time. In one instance, I, I read this book over 10 years ago, for example, and for some reason it just stuck with me. He described the difference between where they got the words Arctic and Antarctic. The word Arctic is derived from the Greek word Arctos, which means bear. bear. So, Antarctic without bear. Nope. That's the difference between Antarctic and the Arctic. So, I just think he's fascinated like that. It just gets stuck in your head. You don't even know what's happening. So, kudos yeah. to him. A lot it's, of fiction writers don't do that. And he does. He researches the hell out of his books. Like, he, he really prepares yeah. when he writes these things. And that's why the stories are so believable. 
because he takes, um, a, in, in the beginning of all his books, he'll, he'll reference that, you know, while um, any, um, any uh, mentions of technology and, 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 and these things that are mentioned are true, but the, the, the story that he weaves around it is fiction, and it's, it's, his books are so well done that it's, it's, it's hard to separate the fact and the fiction. Right. And that's why so many people were up in arms with uh, the Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, and, and whatnot, because people actually took it as, as, as mm. fact almost. And, and it's just, it's a fictional story, but that's so yeah. well put together that you, it, you walk away going, mm, you know. <laughs> and it also makes it very forgivable for why it takes <coughs> so long to release another novel. It took seven years for him to re release The Lost Symbol. Then when you read The Lost Symbol, you totally get it. So I think that's where he makes up for his fast-paced writing is because he did that much research. So that's probably why Stephen King's able to release a book or two a year and Dan Brown takes several, several years. Yeah. And I, well worth the wait on every one. Well worth the wait. I've read every Dan. one of his books, and um, I have to say, this may be close to my favorite. Um, the thing is, with all the Robert Langdon books, the stories are essentially kind of all the same. It's just a different It's a different storyline on the same concepts, um, usually religious-based, whereas this is, uh, this is more like a Tom Clancy-type uh, uh, government and uh, political conspiracy. And it was... It, 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 it really grabbed me. It really, it, it's, I do also wish that he would uh, continue with Rachel Sexton and Michael Pollan, maybe, um, like he did with Robert Langdon, but I'm also happy to, to continue reading Robert, Robert Langdon. Absolutely. So we're probably going to cut this, cut this video at that point. And uh, guys, you could have tuned into a number of different book review channels. For some reason, you decided to click on this one. I love the hell out of you for, I'm sure my partner at Burning Bush, Chris here, appreciates Absolutely. the hell out of it. Burning Bush loves you, yeah. appreciates you. Less than a week to Christmas. To all the subscribers who are watching this, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever the hell you celebrate, I hope you enjoy the hell out of it.